Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Eureka Valley Harvey Milk Branch Library. Uh -huh. My name is Karen Sunheim, and I'm the branch manager here. And welcome to Lesbian Publishers, a historical perspective and a current view. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to mention a few upcoming events. Next Tuesday night, August 2nd, we have, a tra we have trash connoisseur Jennifer Blowdryer and a group of her writer friends. They've all contributed to an anthology called Good Advice for Trendy People. And we'll discuss everything from door etiquette for the nightlife challenged to how to be an art star. And on August 16th, we will have author and psychotherapist Rick Eisensee here, who will be celebrating the re-release -re of his three books on gay men and relationships. Also, while you're here, please take a look at the Out at the Library exhibit. Out at the Library, which continues through October, is a celebration of the 10-year anniversary of the James C. Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center, taking place at the main library and at this branch. And here we have an exhibit of memorabilia and documents from the Gay Games archives, as well as artwork from the Reversing Vandalism exhibit. Tonight's special program is part of the series Out at the Library. And tonight we'll be talking about lesbian publishing, the past, the present, and the future. I would like to thank the Friends and Foundation of San Francisco Public Library for their financial support of this program. I would also like to thank Jim Van Buskirk of the James C. Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center, Catherine King and Joan Jasper from the Office of Exhibitions and Programming, Eric Montero of our media department for videotaping the program tonight, and I'd like to thank Carol CJ, our moderator for the evening, for working so hard at coordinating the pro this program. And you can also buy an Out at the Library catalog, which goes through all the exhibits in three locations here tonight after the program. Um, and I would like to introduce now Carol CJ. Carol CJ has made an enormous contribution to the world of lesbian publishing. She started Old Wives Tales Bookstore in 1976 after working at a woman's, book, a woman's Place bookstore for two years. She published Feminist Bookstore News from 1976 to 2000. In 2003, she launched Books to Watch Out For, a suite of book review publications for gay men, lesbians, and feminists. And now I'd like to welcome Carol CJ. is such a great gathering. Um, you know, I want to welcome you all. And, you know, I wish I was having a, you know, that this was a party and we could just all dance, you know, this, <laughs> the combination of, um, you know, this kind of incredible historic people in this audience is pretty awesome. And I hope that many of you will get up during the um, discussion period and talk about the particular place that you came in and the contributions that you made or the work you did or what you thought was most important during those years or better yet, you know, what you see as our future. Um, you know, there, there are easily a dozen or two dozen people who could be on this panel. And, you know, that's why I think the party theme. Um, so um, this is, as Karen said, part of the uh, Out at the Library celebration. And if you haven't seen the exhibit here or the one downtown, I'd certainly encourage you to go down and take a look. There's some incredible correspondence up on the walls. There's um, Barbara, some of Barbara Greer's great collection of pulp novels, um, letters about the launching of Nyad Press, Barbara's correspondence with Mae Sarton and other people, um, and some incredible photographs, and it's just a wonderful collection. Um, Let's see. I think I'm here not so much as a publisher, but to represent the uh, periodical side of the lesbian publishing movement, um, and also to represent the bookselling side of the lesbian publishing movement, without which I maintain there would be no lesbian publishing movement. Um, and there's uh, some rather esteemed lesbian feminist booksellers here in the audience as well. Um, Joining me tonight are Joan Pinkfoss, Frederic Della Costa, and Renata Stendhal. 
Um, you may have noticed that Barbara Greer is not with us tonight. Um, she, over the course of the last week, has been through a hurricane. Her house was struck by lightning, and a very good friend of hers uh, was killed in an automobile crash, and she made what I think is a very lazy decision for a 71-year-old to stay home. Um, but we miss her. And she also sent her comments, and Jewel Gomez has consented to read them uh, during uh, the discussion. So I will briefly introduce uh, the people that, who will be speaking. Um, and then each person will speak. Well, I'll do a little bit of context setting. And then each person will speak, and Barbara Greer will be ghost spoken here. Um, then we'll have a little, perhaps a little Q&A among ourselves, and then open it up to all of the insights and questions and thoughts and wishes and dreams of the many wonderful women here tonight. Um, Joan Pinkfoss, in 1972, I believe, was one of the founders of the Iowa City Women's Press, an illustrious organization that both printed and published books and at various times included uh, a typesetting aspect, a bindery, um, and I may have this correct, or it may be my mythology, but passionately held the belief that women needed to be able to control the entire means of production from writing to the reader so that no men could ever again censor our ideas and our communication. Um, it's not that I personally feel passionately about that, but um, we continue to have some of those problems today. Joan later co-founded our locally owned and operated Aunt Luke Book Company and has shepherded it through many, many transitions over the years and is a fine and wonderful publisher. Uh, Frederic de la Costa co-founded Cleus Press in 1980 with Felice Newman. Cleus, after, or Cleus, Frederic, after a stint working with Out and Out Books, um, went on to found Cleus, co-found Cleus, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And Cleus, to my mind, is the quintessence of lesbian publishing. Every time you say lesbians can't or lesbians don't, they do. <laughs> um, every time you hear that lesbians don't publish, they publish, whatever. Uh, lesbians publish only romances, <laughs> shot a hole in it. Lesbians don't publish literary work, <laughs> lesbians don't like sex, <laughs> lesbians only like vanilla sex, <laughs> uh, lesbians don't publish men, Lesbians don't, well, you know, you get the picture. That's Cleos Press. Renata Stendhal will talk about her experience as one of the founders of Edgeworks, a brilliant, if short-lived, lesbian publishing company that burst onto the scene in 2000, is that right? With an in, one intense nine-book season. She will also talk, as will the rest of us, about lesbian publishing internationally. She is also the author of a photobiography of Gertrude Stein and the author of True Secrets of Lesbian Desire, Keeping Sex Alive in Long-Term Relationships. You know, where did this thing come from that lesbians and lesbian feminists don't like sex? I mean, where did that come from? Men. Men. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she's also a translator, a counselor, and a writing coach. Um, so, um, that said, I will say a few things about the context and where we came in. Um, I believe that lesbian publishing is a story that hasn't yet been told. We've lived through some of it. Many of us have created it. Most of us have just reveled in it. Um, and we'll capture more of that history tonight. But I want to say that lesbian publishing is also a history of resisting sexism, of resisting invisibility as lesbians and also as women, that it's an experience of sexism as much as homophobia, and that the two together make a much longer row to hoe than it would be without the double discrimination. Um, some of the missing history, um, 
just to be a little participatory, who in this room knows that Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses, was first published by a lesbian press? And that's a very high percentage. And how many people know that the second edition of Ulysses was published by a lesbian press? <laughs> you know, us Nikes, we got both the English language edition and the French language edition. And it was published, for those of you who didn't know, by the proprietors of two of Paris's most legendary bookstores, uh, Sylvia Beach and Adrienne Monnier, who were a lesbian couple, although they published individually. Uh, Sylvia sold books at Shakespeare and Company and published in English, and Adrienne at, I will spare you my French, a bookstore which translates as the, Friends, the House of the Friends of Books, and she published in French. Um, without them, Joyce probably would have disappeared from the literary scene. And do lesbians get credit for that, I ask you? <laughs> um, and there's another story here. Monnier was also a writer, and as long as she wrote under a pseudonym, a male pseudonym, mind you, all the writers in Paris celebrated her work. When she finally came out about it, silence, and suddenly, all these people who were so interested in this author had nothing to say. It seems that they liked her better as their bookseller. They liked her better as someone that introduced them to each other and sort of acted as a publicist for them and was kind of in that help the guys out category rather than as a peer. Uh, not being a rich girl, at that point, she went right back to bookselling where she could continue to make a living. But you know, I have to tell you that the, region, the legions and the ranks of lesbian booksellers are pretty impressive, but we disappear. And then there's what I like to call the Susan Sontag factor. Uh, most of you already know that, um, but I'll just quote Larry Kramer's wonderful remarks, who said, Susan is beyond being a lesbian, except for the fact that she has affairs with women, she doesn't really fit into that category. <laughs> What she is more than anything is an intellectual. I don't know, I look upon her as a Venus with Hera, some great goddess that is on Mount Olympus and beyond, sex, beyond sexuality. She's in that category. And I think Mount Olympus, beyond sexuality? What do you think those people were doing, or those gods and goddesses were doing? So except for the fact that many women have had affairs with women, there is no history of lesbian publishing. <laughs> But don't get me started, and I will just stop there with that whole line of thought. Um, but the Sontag effect has plagued our history. Um, and I will just let you entertain yourselves with the great lesbian writers who no one ever thinks of as lesbians, you know. Um, and I will also say that I can't tell you how many times since I launched uh, Books to Watch Out For, which has both a gay men's edition, which is written by our local hero, uh, Richard Labonte, in absentia in his Canadian lifetime, um, and the lesbian edition. I can't tell you how many people have looked me in the eye and said to me, I don't read lesbian books. I'm not talking people, I'm talking lesbians. As if any of these people would say to me, I don't read. any other category of human being and look me in the eye and say that. Um, but somehow, it's okay to say that about lesbians. Go figure. So I want to say that at the point where we all came in, um, there had been lesbian pulps, and they had certainly been published, and they started disappearing. and. For me, in about 1973, I started finding these other books. I found on a trip to California something called Songs to a Handsome Woman by Rita Mae Brown, published by Diana Press. Mm -hmm. um, and I took it back to my hometown in the Midwest, and I said, this is going to change the way we think about ourselves. This is going to change the way we love each other. These ideas, this, this other stance about how to be a lesbian. I had heard of, and I'd actually read the lead essay in Madness Network News, Edward the Dyke, 
and other poems published by the Women's Press Collective here in Oakland. Um, I bought a copy of this on a motorcycle trip, and I had 3,000 miles and one book. <laughs> and I let myself read a different poem every day. And I could read any of the ones I'd already read, but I couldn't start more than one new poem a day. That's how hungry and desperate many of us were at that point in time. Um, after I came to California, I found things like Class and Feminism, published by Diana Press. What, what a combination of thoughts. Um, and even more exciting, Lesbianism and the Women's Movement. <laughs> So that's kind of the early, early women's liberation uh, moment of the world changing. And so that's the point where Joan and a group of people started the Iowa City Women's Press. All right, so I, I'm sort of following Carol's instructions here, and tr one, trying to keep it short, and two, following a little bit of an outline, which I've kind of broken down into years to make it a little easier. but. Um, can people hear in the back? Yep. Good. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> well, that's 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 the lot of a publisher. We're always the voice behind the scene, you know. So we try not to go out in public if we can help it. Um, uh, I, I got to Iowa City, I went to the Writers' Workshop in Fiction in Iowa City to get my MFA in between 1967 and 69. And those, as so many of you know, were really amazing times politically. There was the Civil Rights Movement, anti-Vietnam Movement, uh, the, the National Guard, Guard Armory in Iowa City got blown up in 68, SDS meetings, and, um, but as for lesbians, so anyway, this was part of what formed me uh, as a person and um, made, made my work very grounded in social justice work um, early on. But a, as for lesbians, there was nobody out in the circles that I was in. That of the 200 or so students in the writer's workshop, there were only two women. And when I went to the one bar where the writers and and gays and people of color hung out the sort of alternative bar. There was only one lesbian couple, and they'd come in from the country. I mean, they were a very interesting couple, but uh, you wouldn't see them hanging out many places. So um, I left uh, after those two years and went far away from Iowa City and did some teaching. And um, then I came back in uh, 72 because Iowa City was a very different and changed place. There was a lesbian community of scores and scores of women. And don't, don't ask me how this happened, just sort of overnight, people decided they could be uh, public. And it, it didn't, of course. It had a lot to do with some of the early work that had been done, some of the magazines that were being published, one of which, Ain't I a Woman, was a very important, influential uh, rag that came out of Iowa City and was actually started by women who were working class women who were um, uh, students or wives of uh, students who had been disillusioned by the male dominance of SDS. So it started out as sort of a leftist political magazine and then turned into a lesbian magazine as more and more the women probably became lesbian. I think that's probably <laughs> what happened. But, um, but several of us began talking about a printing press at that time um, uh, in order to control how information got out because we realized that that was an important part of what this change was going to be. Um, and this was especially true because with a I Women tried to do a self-help issue, which in those days, self-help was mostly about health and, uh, and sometimes was euphemism for abortion because, of course, at that point it wasn't legal. And uh, so one of the things in the self-help movement was to learn how to use a speculum. And so uh, NI Women was doing an issue on, with um, graphic photographs, and, and we, they couldn't find a publisher to uh, print. The regular printer wouldn't print it, and they couldn't find another printer to print it. So that became even clearer when you talk about what the needs were. We, we saw those needs as being very important. And at the same time, as Carol said, um, I think that that community, because it was perhaps because it was based in the Midwest and 
it was difficult to find jobs um, uh, to make livings. Uh, that it did, we did move very much towards figuring out how women could expand into areas of work uh, that were, had been traditionally male dominated. And so the trades were, one, were obviously that. And so when we started the printing press, the first thing we had planned to do and what we did do was put out two manuals. Um, uh, my props happen to be. So I wanted you to have a, a gander at these because they're really old. So Against the Grain, a Carpentry Manual for Women. Mm. And, um, mm. Yes. <laughs> and the Greasy Thumb, Auto Mechanics Book for Women. Mm. Right. <laughs> so, um, and so we continued. But part, part of the problem with the printing press is, is that we ran it as a business so some women could make an income, some of the women who didn't have other opportunities. And um, pretty soon we lost the possibility of publishing. So in 82... Barb Weezer, and that's a name I hope a lot of you know. She uh, now is uh, the manager of Amazon Bookstore, one of the few women's bookstores left in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and I uh, started Aunt Loot Books, and, uh, which was named after her great aunt. If anybody wants to know the story sometime, I'll tell it to you. But, um, and our commitment and our goal, Barb and I shared a lot of the same uh, political values and, uh, and literature values. And so we really wanted to be publishing books by lesbians that dealt with the issues that were important to their lives, and also to be publishing novels by lesbians that um, were, you know, dealt with what their lives were like as lesbians. So one of the first books that we did was um, Saturday Night in the Prime of Life by Dodici Espadu, and that was um, uh, a lesbian uh, novel, short, but really interesting. And uh, we did a number of others, including uh, Shadow on a Tightrope, which was about fat politics, which had not been really addressed well f at all, and it's still in print. And um, I just saw somebody come in with an old historic background. So, um, uh, so we did Shadow on a Tightrope, and that was very important for us. This, uh, so we continued to work together uh, until about 85, and then Barb decided to follow her dreams to Minneapolis. And at that point, I had, took a hard look at um, the fact that being as small as we were, we couldn't do justice to the, to, the pub, to, the, to the authors that we were publishing. And after much talking with uh, Sherry Thomas uh, back and forth in San Francisco, where I was getting an electrical license so I could support myself by being a publisher, um, we decided to merge the two presses after a long discussion with my partner at the time about moving to California. So in 86, Aunt Lute got moved to California, joined up with Spencer's, and for about three years it was called Spencer's Aunt Lute. And um, during that time, um, let's see, what we, uh, during that time I was, well, before I left Iowa City, uh, because of all the things that were going on in Iowa City and all the work that had been done on class and race for years there, um, I was very, I was supported in, in the notion that um, there was a lot missing in publishing, uh, in, in including lesbian publishing, in terms of the voices that were being heard. And so I became more and more interested in trying to do um, voices by women of color. And so part of my, most of my work at Aunt Lute, uh, Spitzer's Aunt Lute was, uh, well, we had already done Audre Lorde and Paula Gunn Allen, but it was working with Gloria and Sadua, Cherry Muhanji, and Carmen de Mataflores, um, and other women to put, out, to put out their work. At the same time, we were doing really exciting work uh, with lesbians, which was, uh, the, the, you know, Joanne Lulon's well-known Lesbian Sex and Lesbian Passion, which was really great. And we did, did the book, Why Can't Sharon Kowalski Come Home, which was you know, a, a really important book to be doing. Uh, we had to take out liability insurance. You know, We had to do all sorts of things because it was um, a scary proposition, but it was, it was a book that we were proud to have done and I think helped change a lot of lesbians' lives and how they looked at partnership and how they looked at um, forcing the legal system to recognize them. So, um, and at the same time that this is going on, and I hope we get to this, 
was the the women in print movement had started. What, what would you say, Carol or Frederick? What would you say? Would, in the seventies, I, I went to the late seventy-eight. Yeah, so seventy-eight might have been seventy-eight. Seventy-six. Okay, so Carol was a big part of that, and that's when we all the presses began to get to know each other, and it was so exciting because you didn't feel like you had to cover the whole shebang. You know that you knew everybody was out there doing their own piece, and um, I've always respected Clay's work because I think they really have made such a deep cut into the puritanical underpinnings of American society, and. Uh, and, and I hope that Aunt Lute has done that in maybe a little different direction, too. Um, when it became clear that Sherry and Thomas and I had different goals about what we were wanted to be doing, we separated back out. And I really wanted to create Aunt Lute as, a, as an institution that, that embodied the diversity inside the institution of publishing so that uh, the people who selected the manuscripts, the people who were on staff, so forth, were were represented some of the communities we were publishing. And, um, and at the same time, we started an internship program uh, that would help teach young women how to do publishing. We started, not only did we start many writers' careers, but we started many women into the publish, publishing world in, in other parts of the country. So that, that's been exciting. Um, and I think, I think that goal of continuing to do new voices and building careers from a grassroots perspective was so informed by, I mean, not all of our writers are less, uh, we, all the writers of Antlute now, not all of them are lesbians. And in fact, it's probably um, less than 50% now, and it used to be more than that before. And you know, we, we could talk about that at length, but as to how that happened. But um, I think that what's important to say is, is that it's still, contains that grassroots connection to community. And that that's something that, I, that I've that i learned in my lesbian political days that will, will never, never leave me, that, um, that, it, that it, has to, it has to be built out of and spoken to and, and be a part of the community that you exist in to have the value to carry into some knowledge that's important. And that the fact that it sparks dialogue across c cultures is great, and we do a lot of panels and things like that. But I, I think that that's one of the most important things that we try to keep a hold of. And as a result, if you look at that, what you see is there's a, there's a never-ending need for the possibility of uh, making room for new voices, because there's always a new voice coming up uh, that, that needs expression that will never happen in New York City. and um, and there are probably even authors here who could talk about how they're really worried about what their careers might look like as a lesbian writer if New York decides they have enough lesbian writers this year or next year or the year after. So um, I, th I think that, that that's part of why we need to keep looking at what we're doing as important. And I, and I also believe that in uh, other communities and other countries that you know there'll be new different forms of lesbian communities coming out, and they too will need a place to uh, make their voices heard. So that's a possibility for all of us to, to be there for. So I think I'll end with that uh, and hope that I can say something more pithy at a, at a later date. <laughs> And now we will have uh, Barbara Greer channeled to us <laughs> through the graciousness of Jewel Gomez. This is so unlike Barbara Greer. That, uh, I'm, I'm speaking personality-wise, too. Well, to say that I think I first met Jewel when she was um, publishing Conditions Magazine. Is mm. that where we met? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really honored to, to be able to sort of jump in for Barbara. Um, one, as a San Francisco library commissioner, commissioners hardly ever get to do events. <laughs> they just show up. Um, but I'm also really, really pleased because I, I, I'm really disappointed not to see Barbara and Donna, uh, who I haven't seen in about 15 years, because the lesbian feminist literary movement is what uh, formed the ground for my career. 
really. And it, if it weren't for these women here and Barbara uh, and Nancy Berriano, I probably wouldn't have ever published. And Donna uh, and Barbara were at a National Women's Studies conference and heard me talk about what was going to become the Gilda stories. And Donna made a <laughs> kind of a look. And it was like the two of them were communicating. Barbara did a beeline for me like a cruise missile. <laughs> I'd never seen anyone move that fast in my life. And uh, I understood how she had scaled the heights to do the work that no one else was doing. So this is Barbara's statement. Um, my life is my publishing history. I began by collecting lesbian books at age 16, getting clues from anywhere, including my own mother. By 23 and 24, when I began working for the magazine The Ladder, I first met Jeanette Foster, author of Sex Variant Women in Literature. I had about, by then I had about 350 to 400 books in the field, and that would be about 1958. I worked for the latter from 56 until 72, publishing it for its last two years of life, and it ended in October of 72. Two women approached my lover Donna McBride and I and asked us to begin a publishing company with them. Nyad Press was born January 1, 1973. The press was officially closed in April of 2003. Instead of selling the company, we turned it over to other women. The resulting company is Bella Books, run by Linda Hill, ironically a Nyad author, and Becky Arbogast, the last Nyad employee before Donna and I retired. The things I did to make a living during the nine years from 1973 to 1982, when I became the first paid employee of Nyad Press, are not worth mentioning. <laughs> Donna was a librarian and had a good job. Our life, though, was run by our 80-hour weeks, and in 1982, Donna told me to quit my job and become Nyad, and become Nyad Press full-time. She joined me six months later, and we began to grow enormously, being able to put all our time and energy into Nyad. Our goal was to make lesbian books, particularly works of fiction, available massively to lesbians everywhere. Our political priorities were set in the early movement years when we decided that lesbians were far less allied with gay men and far more allied with the feminist movement. In most ways, that colored everything that we did. This work is probably more important today than it was when we began and it is happening on a much larger scale. While we do not have as many lesbian publishers now as we have had in some periods in the recent past, that is, I believe, a temporary thing. I saw Bella Books go from a rocky beginning to solid financial and publishing stability beyond my wildest dreams. I am not fully at leisure to discuss all their plans. But I believe they will outdo me enormously, and nothing, nothing could make me happier. Didn't I sound like Barbara just now? <laughs> Except your voice dropped My instead voice. of getting louder. <laughs> Many critics seem to believe that as an internet world, we will eventually have no readers, and that is just not true. Our old Nyad press list is now Bella Books' growing list, and it is doing the same, getting bigger. Lots of my customers who began with us years ago and were then far older than I are gone from us. But there seems to be an unlimited supply of women who like, need, and want the books. There is abundant evidence that our movement was always a print media movement. But this is the same movement that makes women's basketball possible today. It is also, in some manner, responsible for the wonderful sight of a woman driving a gigantic bulldozer and clearing hurricane-damaged houses and rubble from roads. We are part of what makes it possible for women, at least in most countries, to have almost any job, any work. 
We have, ironically, cut a lot of the gender classifications of earlier life away from our lives today. It doesn't matter a bit if we think we still need lesbian publishing. Our opinion is not being considered happily. I have noticed that lesbians are still springing up to begin their own companies and publish their own works, and then, as was often done before, begin grabbing up authors around them and growing even before they know they are. An example, one I love a lot, is take one well-placed physician and professor who becomes first a lesbian novelist and then a publisher and then a distributor and then find someone else to distribute her books, her own and everyone else's, and then decides that her surgical experience is interfering with her time flow in her new job, and she gives that up and devotes herself entirely to being Radcliffe, the author. Say you don't love the arrogance and joy of someone naming herself after Radcliffe Hall and bold strokes the publisher. Just as there is no way to remember all the beginnings, there is no way to predict the endings. But as a bet, I think we will be around in fact or in spirit a long, long time from now. And again, I am not Barbara Greer. <laughs> Thank you, Jewel. That was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Really yes. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, how did Clea start? Clea, st uh, Clea started with Felice. Um, my partner was here. Uh, my work partner. <laughs> um, I, uh, I met Felice in graduate school and she was already um, had caught the bug of publishing. She was um, had been working with Motherwood Publication, which I believe with uh, KNOW was the first um, women's publishing company in the US. Um, she, uh, when I met her, was working on her MFA and she was printing um, Women in Honor, Adrienne Rich's mm -hmm. book, uh, Women in Honor, mm -hmm. Some Notes and Lying. And, um, and we got together and, uh, and uh, moved to New York together, uh, where I got a job at, at, at Out and Out Books, which was a Brooklyn-based uh, uh, lesbian publishing company that was run by Joan Larkin, uh, who is um, mm -hmm. a poet whom I'm sure you've read. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in 1978, we moved to Minneapolis uh, and both worked as printers uh, because we thought it was important to know how to print the books. And at that time, there was um, well, there was Iowa Movement City Press, which was hugely uh, influential on in our deciding to uh, to start Cleus. Um, there was um, there was Nyad, um, there was Spinsters, which uh, Maureen Brady and uh, Judith, Judith, Judith McDaniel. McDaniel. Um, uh, there was and then there was Persephone, which was sort of the Rolls Royce of lesbian publishing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and uh, and uh, and then there was this extraordinary woman who, uh, um, I. We were working as printers, both of us, this extraordinary woman who uh, gave us um, $30,000 to uh, start a publishing company, and her name is uh, Mary Trotman, and she is 80-some um, years old, and she lives in L.A., and without her, we'd, there would be no clears. Yes. Um, so that's sort of how we started. We'll be 25 years old this year. Um, we started with one book, really. We didn't really know what we were doing um, in terms of publishing, but uh, we had this idea um, about a book. There was, it was a time where there was a lot of, uh, the, the conversation was very much about violence against women. Um, you know, Andrea Dworkin and, and Catherine McKinnon were in Minneapolis at that time, and we were in Minneapolis. Um, there, was a, um, there were amazing magazines. There was uh, No More Cages, I don't know if you remember that magazine that was uh, about women in prison. There was a lot of conversation about, about uh, uh, women and violence. So uh, 
um, it was very theoretical, um, some of it, and, and it was mostly about documenting the violence and the victimization of women. Some, from, the, from the beginning, we decided that um, we were going to take a somewhat different stance and, and uh, publish a book that documented the resistance of women to violence instead of the victimization. So we did this, this book, which really in some ways is sort of the theme of what we did after that, which uh, was uh, gathering the testimonies of um, women who worked in um, rape crisis centers and battered women shelters and, and, uh, and uh, lesbian separatists, uh, uh, women who were taking arms um, against their attackers, women who had uh, killed their attackers, uh, Juanita Thomas in Michigan, mm -hmm. whom we went and visited. Um, uh, there was just so much there, and, and it, there was so much energy in the women's movement there, and there were so many ideas, and just also so many actions being, um, women were very active, you know, there was a lot of street theater, there was just so much going on, and we thought it would be really interesting to have a book that documented that. In some ways, it was, you know, this very modern way of looking at history. So we came out with this book. I mean, in some ways, it was completely crazy because it was 400 pages. It was eight and a half by 11. Uh, it was, and it had photographs. So we blew the entire $30,000 on this book. And then what do we do? So, um, and then what happened was that uh, Felice's dad came to Minneapolis and bought her this old beaten up Volvo uh, station wagon. So now we had this book, we had to sell the book, right? <laughs> so we put cases of the books in the back of the Volvo, and then we put the sleeping bags on top, and we started driving. Uh, and we did this, what, eight week tour or seven week tour around the country, and we went to battered women's shelters and rape crisis centers and women's bookstores and take back the night marches, and we sold the books. And the piles started to diminish, <laughs> and we were sort of sleeping like this. <laughs> and, um, and then, but people really noticed uh, this book. I mean, it was incredibly ambitious, and it was um, really in-your-face politics. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of the, the history of, of Clear's Press. Uh, it was sort of a scary book in a way, you know? Uh, women killing the... Oh, the title was Fight Back, uh, Feminist Resistance to Male Violence, and it came out in uh, 1980. Um, so, you know, I, I can sort of talk about the history of Clear Express with some of the books because we were so driven by the ideas that authors came uh, and presented to us in some ways, and we grew because of um, the idea of those authors. So I'll just give you f some historical markers. Um, so 1980, Fight Back. Uh, 1984, we did a book called AIDS, The Women. Um, in uh, 1987, we did a book called Sex Work, which uh, was a book that documented the rights of uh, sex workers. Um, just to give you an idea that, that for us, publishing was about, in some ways, uh, uh, staying really true to a politics and acquiring uh, readership. And so each of the books that we did, in some ways, acquired a wider and wider readership. So for instance, at a time when um, the feminist movement was mostly saying that prostitutes were um, victims and, and, and couldn't really say anything because they didn't have the, the rights or the, uh, um, um, the knowledge to talk about um, sex and work. Uh, we thought it was really important, on the contrary, to have them talk about this and that they had, in fact, a lot of, to contribute to, um, to the feminist movement. Uh, in 87, we published Susie Sexpert, uh, <laughs> Lesbian Sex Work. Um, 87, 88, 90, <laughs> whatever, 90. Um, then we, you know, some of the, the notable books that we did, um, uh, I Am My Own Woman by Charlotte von Mausdorf, and that was, you know, in the late 80s or in the early 90s, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, just like come up and do it, you know. <laughs> 
um, you know, and that was, you know, a book that hardly anybody noticed. And then last year, this uh, um, play based on the book um, yeah. and on the story of Charlotte von Malstorff yeah. uh, won the uh, Pulitzer and the Tony Award. Uh, and uh, let's see, other books that were really important. Body Alchemy, Lauren Cameron, uh, the first, one of the first trans books on transsexuality. Um, and um, other books that were really important, Anne Bannon, and Bannon, which, who had been uh, published by Nyad Press and was out of print. Uh, we've republished her books and now um, we have like film production companies knocking at the door wanting to do miniseries. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, those, those are the things that really uh, changed um, the way we've published. Those were adventures. Christine Jorgensen, the uh, huh. Um, huh. autobiography of Christine Jorgensen, which was an adventure in itself. You know, she <laughs> had she had died without uh, without leaving a, a will, and uh, and we had to settle her estate. We had to find who had the will. We found this person who lives who was her roommate, who lives in Bodmin, Cornwall, uh, in this little town. And nobody knows that uh, she's transsexual. Uh, we went and found uh, this woman, and she had a copy of Christine Jorgensen's will. So because of this will, we were able to settle the estate and publish the book. Um, you know, there were a lot of adventures at Clias. Um, and, um, and that gives you an idea of um, the kind of work that we're doing. Um, we, we felt and we feel that we are very connected to the rest of the world. In, in, um, in the uh, 80s, we published a little school by Alicia Partnoy, an Argentinian writer who um, was uh, um, was a student at the time of the junta in Argentina and was imprisoned in a concentration camp. Um, Another Love by Elizabeth Galgochi, who's a Hungarian lesbian, who wrote a novel about the Soviet invasion of her country. Um, no Place Like Home by Melanie Friend, um, a book of photographs about the uh, situation of Albanians before, during, and after the Kosovo War. Uh, and some of our books are published by um, Midnight Editions, which is a human rights imprint of Clear Press. So that gives you an idea of what uh, kind of books we're doing. Um, one of the questions that, that Kel asked of me was, what compelled you to do this work? So I have this little list here. <laughs> the love of books and adventure. Passion for history, politics, art, and propaganda. Finding conventional heterosexual values repellent. <laughs> the company of women. Being pissed off with the often simplistic analysis that came out and comes out of the feminist and gay movement. The opinion that the desire to fit in is not an intelligent reaction to oppression. <laughs> Wanting to live in the big world. A possibly inflated sense that we can affect culture. <coughs> and above all, a belief that our readers are very, very smart. The audiences have changed, however. And, and as I mentioned, we started as a feminist press, and mostly our, only, our audience was, was feminist women and people on the left, although the left was very critical of books like Sex Work, for instance, because they thought that oppressed people um, how can oppressed people choose to be oppressed? Mm -hmm. As we started publishing um, gay, we started publishing gay men at the onset of the uh, AIDS epidemic, and and gained, I think, a devoted o devoted audience. Best Gay Erotica was created to encourage gay men to pursue the vital erotic exploration and desire that were crucial to them and to us as lesbians and queer people. We've just reissued John Preston's books. John Preston is the grandmaster of gay erotica, gay SM erotica. Um, writers like Pat Califia, now Patrick Califia, were instrumental in analyzing sexual, sexual culture and le legitimize us to an academic audience. You see how we're sort of building on audiences here. Um, Claude Summers, uh, with the, the uh, Queer Encyclopedia series, the visual arts, music, and popular culture, which you all should have. It's a great, great um, um, series. Um, is in most public libraries around the country. And then we have Susie Bright, Violet Blue, Felice Newman, Bill Brandt, Tristan Taormino. Uh, Tristan was in her early 20s when she started editing Best Lesbian Erotica. And she was so articulate. All of them were so articulate and so joyful 
so adventurous uh, that I think they invigorated a new generation of women, lesbians, and men who were determined to explore their sexuality. Um, and I credit them for bringing together a, ge a generation, a new generation of, of heterosexual, bisexual, queer readers who want to explore sex uh, in a positive way. Um, the Good Vibrations Guide to Sex, which now has sold more than 100,000 100, copies, uh, um, really assured us the trust and loyalty of readers who, who thought, who, who knew that if they bought a, a sex guide from Clear's Press, it was going to be well researched, uh, positive, well edited, well written. Um, and then we get reviews, for instance, now um, Felice's book, the whole lesbian sex book, um, gets this review from the Library Journal. Check this out. Um, this comprehensive and superbly competent manual sets a standard for which all popular sex writers should aim, not just for lesbians. Heterosexual <laughs> women could learn a great deal about themselves, as could the men who aspire to please them. That's the Library Journal. Yeah. <laughs> January. <laughs> you know, it's working. <laughs> um, then authors like Gore Vidal, uh, Don Wisey, uh, Gore Vidal, sexually speaking, Don Wise, uh, Black Like Us, and, and, um, and the uh, uh, collected writings of Bayard Rustin, Edmund White, whose uh, arts and letters were just published, Mary Jane Meeker, Highsmith, I don't know if you've read it, you should read it, it's great. Regina Marler, who lives in San Francisco, who uh, edited a, a book called Queer Beats, Catherine Forrest, lesbian pop um, fiction, which just came out. Mm -hmm. Virginia Woolf's Melimbrosia, which had never been published in, in a trade edition. All these books got us reviewed in mainstream newspapers, magazines, such as the New York Times, the LA Times, et cetera, et cetera, and propulsed us out of the ghetto, um, brought us writers who never thought of Clear's Press as a possible publisher. Um, this year, we are reissuing uh, some classic lesbian novels from people you may or may not have heard of. Françoise Malégeris, who is a French writer who wrote lesbian, fantastic lesbian uh, novel in the 1950s. Um, which was originally published by FSG, completely disappeared. It's a great lesbian book. Most people have never read it. We're publishing her. Dorothy Stretchy, Olivia. Do you remember Olivia? Yeah. Any of you yes, read yes. Olivia? <laughs> Fantastic lesbian book. <laughs> Dorothy Stretchy, you know, the um, sister of Lydon Stretchy? Bloomsbury, all those people. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we follow up Nyad's Press, um, Glorious Footsteps, and we're publishing more of the lesbian pop novels. Uh, we're publishing the bad lesbian pop novels, the ones that end badly, the ones where the lesbians are really, really, really bad. <laughs> um, we're publishing this year two memoirs by heterosexual men, uh, Matthew Ross, uh, Yom Kippur Agogo, Kevin Keck, Oedipus Rex, which is about his, uh, which is a sexual memoir, because they came to us because they thought Clear Express is a home for us, and we thought, yeah, sure, come on in. <laughs> uh, we're publishing Deconstructing Tyrone, which is a collection of essays by black women about men, compiled by two journalists who work for the Washington Post and the Detroit Free Press. That gives you an idea of the kind of books that we're doing. So um, I think we're doing okay. Um, <laughs> One of your questions, questions was, um, do we still need lesbian publishing? Um, yeah. Uh, um, I think there's some really, really great work happening at uh, larger publishers um, because there are some gifted editors uh, working in larger publishers. But we have to remember that it's still very, very important to think of who owns the press. Things might change, editors move on, uh, so forth. So I think it is still a very, very crucial an important thing to have lesbian presses, gay and lesbian presses, um, um, publishing gay and lesbian books and whatever else they feel like publishing. Um, practically speaking, it means a level of commitment on the part of, uh, of the, uh, the presses to the authors, to the books, the content, the covers, the longevity of the books um, that very few other publishers or mainstream publishers are able to um, offer to the authors. In the case of Clias, it often means a, a long-term uh, relationship, many of our authors have more than one book on the list, a shared passion for the work and for the vision of the author. Um, 
for a lot of the early publishers, uh, there was um, a great deal of problems with distribution of books, and it's still a, dis a, pro a problem for a lot of um, a lot of uh, small publishers. How did you distribute the books? Are readers going to be able to find the books, especially uh, with the advent of Amazon and large uh, chain bookstores? Um, it's really a crucial um, a crucial problem for uh, publishers. We feel that we should um, publish um, quirky books, and but our distribution should be as mainstream as possible. Um, so. Uh, so that the books are in the Barnes and Noble as well as in the uh, gay bookstores, um, we uh, uh, think it's and it's difficult that uh, um, that readers should be able to still find our books in the gay and lesbian um, aisles of those um, of those uh, bookstores. Um, I think we need to be really uh, concerned about the context in which we publish. We, we need to stay close to the culture of the readers and forever expand the audience we serve. It's, it's good economics, it's good politics, uh, it used to be called coalition politics. We, we really like this challenge, that's why we're now the, uh, the largest independent lesbian and gay queer publisher in the world. Um, that's true. <laughs> uh, and in terms of the future, I think I think the future is good. I think um, I think the fact that um, that writers like like Edmund White and Michael Cunningham and Ellen Hollinghurst and Kong Toibin, who you should read, I just read his latest book. It's really great, called The Master. It's wonderful. Uh, I think the fact that they win prizes. I think the fact that that people like Michelle T. Hopefully is going to get a big advance. That Tristan Taramino. Uh, publishes her column in the Village Voice that Sarah Waters' books get made into BBC miniseries. Those are really good signs. Um, what it means for us is that our books, the Clear's books, also get reviewed in the New York Times. It means that our authors get interviewed on Fresh Air. Um, that's all really, really positive. Um, chain and online bookstores now know that there is a huge market for lesbian and gay books. Um, well, independent gay and lesbian bookstores and feminist bookstores knew it all along. Um, as I said, film producers are knocking at our doors. They all come to us because they know what we do. Before that, we were sort of publishing in a desert. So I think it's, uh, it's a really, really good, uh, good time for us to be uh, publishing what we're publishing. I think it's a healthy, um, in terms of content, I think it's a very, very healthy time. Um, Carol asked me to talk a little bit about international publishing. I don't know if we'll come to that. Um, okay, I, I, I don't know very much. Uh, I know in Europe, I know the, uh, the uh, situation in the UK is not very, very good. The uh, Gay Man's Press in the UK and Diva are no longer publishing. Um, the Women's Press in uh, the UK is no longer publishing. Um, the only one that has sort of survived and still doing um, fantastic books is Virago. In France, there are lots of uh, small uh, publishers, uh, and I have the names here. I don't know I, that I want to go through the list here, but I have like one, two, three, four, five, six, 15 uh, gay and lesbian publishers in France. Uh, there are some in Belgium. Um, I think you will be, you could tell us about the uh, publishers in Germany. It's very healthy mm -hmm. uh, publishing in Germany. In Italy and Spain, I don't know. Uh, and then finally, I just I just want to say that um, that it's really really uh, important to to credit some of the people who came before us. I mean, Nyad Press was really did fantastic work. Uh, Persephone Press uh, uh, did fantastic work. I don't know if you remember some of their books. Uh, um, um, what were they? This, <laughs> this bridge called my back. Yeah. Uh, uh, nice Jewish girls. Uh, huh? The coming out stories, all those books, you know, that, that a lot of um, lesbian our generation, my generation, I'm 50 years old, uh, read and, and were incredibly important. Um, and, and also because when Cleo started um, in 1980, uh, those are the people who really, really helped us. Uh, I remember Nyad Press, um, although Barbara Greer made me swear never to say, uh, <laughs> called us and said, I hear you girls are doing this uh, press in Minneapolis. You should come to the Women in Print Conference in Washington, D.C. And we thought, 
we can't go to Washington DC. We don't have money to go to Washington DC. And she sent us money for, for oh, gas wow. to drive to Washington DC. You know, those are the kinds of things that, that used to happen. When we got there, Persephone, the women of Persephone Press said, do you guys have a contract? <laughs> and we thought, well, n no. We that they came. They went. We went into their room and they sat us down and they gave us a uh, sample contract so that we wouldn't have to pay a lawyer to you know all those things that happen. Yeah. I think are uh, um, are really really important to remember. Um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Almost at day one, I happened to be there. Thank Goddess. And um, it turned my life around immediately, 180 degrees, and um, led um, to all sorts of activism creatively. And among them, uh, one of my activist wonderful things that I found to do was translate American feminists. Mm -hmm. Americans were way ahead of us Europeans back then and uh, had some great important authors that absolutely needed to be introduced to the European scene. In my German scene, I, Germany is my motherland, and uh, although I had to leave it because I couldn't stand it when I grew up there, I went to Paris. But um, these um, feminists, for example, it's amazing that you mentioned Adrian Rich, um, the um, book on honor and lying. It uh, is one of those that I translated. <laughs> and um, wouldn't you know that it influenced me greatly when recently I wrote this book about lesbian um, honor, honesty, and truth-telling in sexual relationships or in relationships. So um, I translated Audre Lorde, her poetry and her essays, and went on tour with her in um, Germany and Switzerland. I translated a little Gertrude Stein, which was a big challenge for me as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I picked her one criminal novel, her thriller called Blood on the Dining Room Floor, which of course had nothing about a thriller really. <laughs> and um, I translated Susan Griffin's Woman in Nature, a major book in my becoming a woman, a mensch, um, a lesbian radical feminist. Susan Griffin was the reason that I met my life companion, my soulmate, Kim Chernin, um, a writer who became known uh, for her um, biography of her mother, communist mother, in my mother's house, and then um, being the first woman <coughs> writer in America writing about eating disorders, the hungry self, for example, the obsession. Kim and I, um, because of this translating business and me being a wild, radical, separatist, lesbian feminist in Paris, met at the same cafe and hit it off pretty fast. And uh, I moved here for her in 86. Um, a big leap and we are at Edgework Books. Um, by that time, Kim had um, published about 14 books in major publishing houses in America, and um, was absolutely exhausted and tired of the mainstream publishing world. So were many of our friends, it turns out, in the Bay Area. Um, we also found that many of the very good writers that we knew and felt we were, uh, were not able to publish our books anymore because we were the typical mid-list authors. All of a sudden, uh, publishing seemed to have changed dramatically from um, a place where smaller editions of books, like let's say 5,000, maybe even 2,000 books, could be published. And this was not possible anymore because of the bestseller mania that completely took over. And um, we felt that our books, my own, Kim's, the books we wrote and published together, like Sex and Other Sacred Games, and um, a book about Cecilia Bartoli, our beloved favorite, favorite opera diva, um, that um, these books had all been tempered with by the mainstream publishers, that uh, really we felt this out of controlness that of course writers always feel, the frustration of not really having a say about the cover, the title, um, about even the content. 
it's amazing how often we were pushed into a more commercial corner. That led to edge work books, which uh, was our great desire to publish something that was just more on an edge, the non-publishable edge, the uh, feminist edge, the please let's discover, rediscover what this nostalgic, wonderful thing was that we had when there was a world of feminist, lesbian engagement and passion. We wanted to revive that um, spirit and uh, we were very naive and we were very visionary and very stupid. Um, we, of course, had this vision, intelligent vision, I think, that uh, in, in, the only alternative to this big monster of mainstream bestseller publishing was grassroots little women's collectives. So back to the 70s and women's collectives, do you remember? <laughs> and um, that sort of inspiration of a small group of women who would come together, all writers, all in the same pot, uh, or peas in the same pod, and uh, do this together with a great amount of energy. Well, it turned out that our energy was very, very small because most of the women in our group were writers and not publishers. Mm -hmm. And what a conflict. Um, we were all exhausted after a, a year of preparing for this, and then all of the writers didn't want to go out and, and uh, do marketing for their books. You know, they said, I want to write my next book. Please leave me alone. <laughs> so uh, we ran into this obstacle majorly. We also ran into huge economical obstacles. We had this um, collective with eight uh, and in the end, nine books that were all, I mean, half of the books were written by lesbian authors. Um, and um, the other part were mm, kind of economical marketing thinking of our collective. Like we wanted a political book about the um, Iraq-Iran revolutions and uh, the whole backlash there. So we picked a book um, Susan Perry's book about uh, that time and the woman's coming of age in Iran during the revolution. We picked um, another book that um, seemed important because it was a spiritual book uh, written in a Japanese uh, form of writing about a woman Buddhist monk and her autobiography in, in verse, written completely in verse. Uh, things like that that were definitely on some edge um, and uh, could not be or would not have been published. Um, just when we were ready to produce our books, and of course we picked everything woman made, we picked a woman producing house, um, Cypress House, to do the, the kind of real work. We were very much in a hurry. We did unfortunately not do what you guys did, meaning go to learn with Clay's books or with um, yeah. your, your press, of course, um, or any other lesbian feminist press. We thought, oh, we have published, we know, you know, totally untrue. We knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we stumbled over our own feet uh, and we stumbled over America's tragedy of 9-11. Just when we were ready, this happened, and um, we had had great support inside um, the women's collective of resourceful women, women's donors, women's philanthropy. This is what made us exist at the beginning and gave us um, the money, believing in our feminist project, reanimating feminist ideas, and uh, launched us. But after 911, uh, just when we had lost, uh, I mean, invested all our money in books that were, in fact, quite expensive. They, they were hard covers. Um, they looked beautiful, we thought, and would give us a chance to um, publish paperbacks in other companies, if not in our own, so that we would get the money of the paperbacks and there would be a kind of new source of income for the press. But uh, these sources dried up so fast that you wouldn't believe it. After 911, there was a sort of no philanthropy, thank you, uh, we are all afraid, uh, for about six months to a year. And 
just at this point, we would have needed money for marketing, for, um, you know, really doing something for this book as in, in addition to what we did, which was creating literary salons. We had a very successful every month salon at the Montclair Women's Club. And um, a lot of women came. Sometimes a hundred women came to our salons uh, discussing books. And there was sometimes um, we chose a topic like um, Jewel uh, Gomez came to discuss with uh, Chitra Divakaruni and myself about erotic writing and things like that that were successful and fun. But it wasn't enough uh, without funding to kind of keep us alive. And even our ninth book, which already had been in production, which was our edge work um, effort for women of color, feminist, huge, thick anthology, four pounds or something like that, on um, writing, political feminist writing by women of color, um, did not make edge work or keep us afloat. So we had to cave in also because of collective factor that um, we were all exhausted. And basically our lessons from the women's movement that collectives are a tricky beast, they seem to kill their members because of all kinds of misunderstandings, <laughs> betrayals, and disappointments. Uh, they all happened again in this replay. And uh, basically, Kim and I did all the work and had to cave in after two years of um, trying very hard. And now Edgework has still a beautiful website that we put a lot of money in. The books still sell, but they didn't sell much beyond 500 uh, copies per book. Uh, my sex book, um, which I then had called Love Learning's Place and Design Myself, is the only one that went into mainstream as a paperback and then uh, was called Secrets of Lesbian Desire. Looked very different. Mm -hmm. Different title, everything of course very different. Less highbrow, more market, mass market, etc. And uh, that was also the only book that was sold in another country in Germany so far, where it did better than in America <coughs> so, so far, because it's still uh, going in both countries. But that was the kind of sad, um, sad, uh, yes, disappointment with that event of uh, trying to be publishers, which we haven't given up, by the way. I must say that um, I think the spark of energy might strike us again, because, of course, now we won't do all these mistakes again that we have made. We would do it very, very differently. And I think we learned a ton of what not to do, and maybe also what to do nowadays when publishing is so different with on-demand publishing and new technologies like that, that um, are a new world and websites and blogs and vlogs and you name it. So um, uh, if we might be back in, in the run at some point, I hope so. Now I'm going to stick myself in here as a publisher briefly before we go on to the commentary and discussion part. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about being a publisher of commentary on what we've all been doing, on what publishers have been doing, on what the writers have been doing, on what the bookstores have been doing, on the coming and going and coming and going and coming and going of all of the different publications that we came up with over the years. Um, I started doing feminist bookstore news in 1976 out of that first incredible women in print conference um, for which I'd like just for a moment to pay homage to June Arnold um, and also the Bacchanal bar in uh, Albany where she sat around one evening with a group of local people and people she was traveling with and said, wouldn't it be amazing to just get all these women that are doing all of these you know, bookstores and publishing companies and magazines together and, and see what would happen. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't do a lot of that. We did a fair amount of sex. Um, <laughs> but she made it happen, you know, at a campfire girl camp in Nebraska, um, <laughs> where the really big debate was if you had to be naked to swim in the pool. But we found that it was ist because, you know, some People weren't comfortable, and other people had very fair skin and would, you know, sunburn in 10 minutes. So 
you know, we learned to expand our political beliefs about that at the time. Um, Nancy Stockwell, I think, is the one who came up with the idea that we should make our own paper because, you know, the patriarchy is going to control us by limiting our access to paper. Paper shortages were a big thing in the news that year. And there, in fact, was some experience with blenders, uh, <laughs> wheat grass, and grasshoppers to see if that could make a mix that turned into paper. And it did, but you couldn't print on it. Um, and it was really quite an incredible time where people learned uh, you know, about contracts or they learned about um, many, many things. Um, oh, I think one of the important roles was that no writers were allowed. The only writers who came had to be passing as publishers or journalists or um, I mean, magazine publishers, and that the idea was that this was about the means of production and getting the information out rather than the debates about the art itself. Um, was this in Nebraska? Yeah, yeah, outside of Omaha, right. because that was equal driving distance right. from the West Coast and the East Coast. <laughs> there were actually people who flew in airplanes to get there, but not very many of them. There were, I think, a seven-car caravan from the Bay Area, um, including one person who uh, had, I believe, just written the women's gun pamphlet and slept with a pistol under her <laughs> pillow to protect us all. Um, so there was this incredible energy, and there were about 20 women's bookstores there, and we found we had so much to tell each other. Oh, yeah, oh inventory system, three by five card, write down the names of the book. Mm. Some really, you know, racy ideas and some ideas and aspects other people hadn't thought about. So um, we just talked all week. It was a week long. Um, oh, I want to say we also had our fair share of spies and paranoia about spies. And everyone wore little lavender bands to prove that they belonged there. So you might be naked, but you were still supposed to be wearing <laughs> your lavender sash. <laughs> some did and some didn't. <laughs> But the bookstores kept talking to each other, and we had so much to share with each other and so much to learn from each other. And, you know, by the end of the week, we had as many questions and answers as we had at the beginning, it seemed. So we had this idea that we should find a way to stay in touch. Now, you have to realize this is 1976. Long-distance calls cost, you know, several dollars a minute. Uh, none of us can afford plane tickets. Um, the photocopy machine had yet to come into common currency. <laughs> we won't even talk about, you know, imagine life before email. Um, so we had several ideas. One was to start kind of a round robin thing where, you know, I'll write something and I'll mail it to you and then you add some and you mail it to her and then you add some. And finally someone said, it's just going to sit on my desk. It won't go anywhere. It'll stop. Okay, we gave that one up. Um, and in the end, Two of us agreed to do a newsletter. It was myself and a woman named Andre from Rising Woman Books, often called Moving Woman Books in Santa Rosa. And because someone had given them a press, a printing press, a Gestetner. So we would get together all this information, and when people failed to send it to us, we would make it up or research it or whatever, just get the gossip. And then we would type it up. And then I would borrow a car and drive to Santa Rosa, and we'd get out the Kostetner and put it in the middle of their living room, collective household, of course, collective bookstore. And we would crank out, you know, 50, 60, 100, 120 copies. And then I'd stay overnight. And then in the morning, we'd get up and turn the pieces of paper over because, you know, they had to dry overnight. And then we would crank <laughs> the other sides and mail them out. And that was, you know, not an uncommon experience of lesbian publishing. The, Women's Press Collective, which was one of the first presses and was here in Oakland. The really big thing was learning how to take that press apart, how to make it work, how to fix it, how to repair it, how to manage it so that we could print the work. Um, so that was a very important part. Um, and little by little, Feminist Bookstore News, it was a newsletter then, got bigger. Um, there were more bookstores, and you know, eventually we decided that maybe we would let the publishers read it. Their newsletter had fallen apart, and you know, we kind of needed them. And 
the magazines were kind of important, and you know, it got bigger and bigger. And you know, eventually, Harper Collins was reading it because they wanted to know what those feminist publishers were publishing, so they could steal the ideas and make a mint on them. Um, we facilitated communication, is a way to say that. Um, in the heyday, you know, I think we probably had about 900 subscriptions, which was pretty good for a trade magazine focused on gay and lesbian books. Um, I mean, f lesbian and feminist books. We did not do gay books. But then eventually, we, I got uh, first Ed Hermans and then Richard Labonte to write what we called um, Gay Men's Lit for Feminist Bookstores. That was the name of the column, and it was a little cheat sheet for all of the women who ran bookstores and also sold gay men's books, but you know, didn't really read the literature carefully and needed a cheat sheet. And because, you know, the gay men had been using feminist bookstore news for years to know what to stock for the lesbians. So we thought it was time to share the information, make it a two-way street. We published things like um, list of women's bookstores. And this was, you know, kind of the heyday list when there were you know, this is about 100, 110 stores. Uh, feminist bookstore catalog, which, you know, we did about 500,000 of this pretty glossy publication. It made me fall in love with color, which I couldn't afford to print, but I found a way. Um, and that lasted until about 2000, and, you know, you can guess the reasons why. Um, why did I do... Feminist Bookstore News, um, I had fallen in love quite early on with the idea of newsletters and getting information to people, that small, that getting specific information to small groups of people was often enough to change the world. I had done a newsletter for abortion counselors in southwestern Michigan, and what we did was pool information about where women could get abortions about how do you send a woman to Japan, to England, and later to New York and California? We did not publish how to send people to Jane in Chicago. That was very careful information because, of course, that was conspiracy to com commit murder for which any of us would be liable. Um, but I had this understanding that getting that specific information to a small group of people would change an enormous number of women's lives. And I believe that about bookstores, about the, what the women's movement needed was information. And the bookstores distributed the information. And the publishers got it into forms that could be distributed and going out. Um, later, I started in 2003, I started doing Books to Watch Out For, which is, oh, you could call it a book review. You can call it a gossip sheet. You can call it. We don't do much scandal mongering. I think we have exhibited great control <laughs> and restraint. Um, and doing that because with the demise of so many gay bookstores and so many feminist bookstores, it's gotten harder to find the information about gay and lesbian and feminist books. Um, if you know the name of a book you want, it's very easy to buy it on the internet. It's very easy to get it. But if you don't have that information, if you don't already know the name of the book, it's very much harder to find the books. Um, so I came up, actually, I was working in Sacramento and doing technical technical writing and at the time. And I was very pissed because I couldn't find a good book to read when I did get home from work. And I wasn't finding it in Sacramento. The bookstore had closed. The women's bookstore had closed. The gay store was really an exciting place if you were under 25, but I wasn't. Um, I was not their audience, and they didn't buy from me. And I was just really pissed that all these years in the women's movement, I couldn't find a book to read. So that kind of drove the idea of putting together something that would be easy to distribute, that could go out by email or print. Um, and I have to say that there was one other driving factor, and that was that I missed the gossip. <laughs> I wanted to know who was publishing what. I wanted to know where the books were. I wanted to know how and where and why and what made things happen. It's something I'd been privy to doing feminist bookstore news for years, and I just kind of felt myself drying up without it. So. 
I'm now doing books to watch out for. There are copies of both the gay men's edition and the lesbian edition, and you know, I would love it if somebody would just pick these things up and start passing them out. I have a stack of subscription forms and postcards, and I think you all must know five people you could give at least one of those things to, and my feelings will be personally hurt if each of you doesn't do that. <laughs> Birthday gift, end of summer gift, holiday gift, uh, broke up with your girlfriend gift, retirement gift, uh, many great occasions for that. Um, and the other real reason is to fight the invisibility, that if the lesbian books, if the gay books, if the feminist books don't find their markets, if they don't find the audience, which is to say if they don't sell, the publishers can't stay in business, or, as is the case with mainstream presses, well, if they don't sell, we know what happens. Um, and with the mainstream presses, if they don't perceive the books as selling, they stop publishing them. And I am personally not ready to go back to a world without a lot of really good, complex, difficult lesbian characters running around in it, um, any more than I want a world without difficult, complex lesbians in it. Um, so I think that's probably all the most important things I had to say. And now I want to uh, move a little into a couple of questions. Um, we've talked some about international publishing. Did anyone have anything else they want to add to that? I wanted to add one story to that. Um, and that's about lesbian publishing in Taiwan. The story about gay and lesbian publishing internationally isn't news anymore. Um, I personally, you know, almost every country has some kind of gay and lesbian publishing going on. Um, I personally know of two groups publishing lesbian books in Taiwan. Um, but the juicy story is what do they do? Um, there's a lesbian publisher in Taiwan called Must Muster. Press um, that has captured kind of the hearts of the Taiwan publishing society because at the uh, Taipei International, the Taipei Book Fair, a couple of, I guess it was about six months ago, eight months ago now, um, when the government said that all books that were inappropriate for young people, which is to say that had sex or anything like that, and it had to be marked with an R as restricted content, you know, our Dyke publisher said, no. She said, well, you know, many of the people in my books are lesbians, but these are not inappropriate books for young people. This is not uh, sexually, you know, unusually sexually explicit content. Uh, it would be inappropriate, and I won't do it. And she didn't do it, and she got away with it. And it was as if no publisher there had ever thought not to bow down to that. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, here's the dyke leading the way and One stealing the hearts and minds. And kind of that's the international publishing story I wanted to tell. Mm, I can add one. Yeah. Um, in, uh, I just uh, made a little Google search, Google Germany, um, to see if uh, hit, line, hit words like um, lesbian publishing companies would render results. And it was very interesting because on the one hand, I met this invisibility that is typical, that nothing came up under these words exactly, directly. But um, uh, in some kind of going, meandering some paths, uh, I found that there is a um, gay lesbian book fair, especially um, in conjunction with the regular book fair that is um, in Leipzig, the big, big German book fair, uh, apart from Frankfurt. And um, of course, that was very interesting to me. It shows some of the particular energy that I feel is in German um, lesbian and gay publishing, mm -hmm. which I think has been growing. This is not a nostalgic, sad story, but quite the opposite that there is more energy, there's still more money, of course, for culture uh, altogether in European countries, in Germany especially. Um, so that was good news. And uh, Berlin is the scene, certainly, for gay and lesbian publishing. And there are quite a number of publishing houses um, I discovered through my own 
book uh, to Secrets of Lesbian Desire, which was bought by one of them, that they existed. And that was a very happy discovery. <laughs> and they're very good and uh, do really great work with a lot of positive energy. Does anyone on the panel have any questions well, you want one, to raise? Well, one thing that's sort of interesting is I think that um, that there are a lot of uh, American authors who are being translated uh, and and published in Europe. There are very, very few European authors that are being translated and published in the U.S., and I've always felt very sad about that um, for several reasons. Since one, it's very expensive to, uh, to translate a book. Um, and a lot of European uh, publishers have subsidies from the government so that they can actually pay for the translations, mm -hmm. uh, whereas our government doesn't really encourage translation of, uh, or you know, encourage us to know that there are other countries. Um, but uh, <laughs> but um, but but m really, what is also um, important to 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 realize is that whenever um, those books are uh, published, and we've published a few. Uh, translations of lesbian authors uh, from other countries, and one of them that I mentioned, Another Love by Isabel Galgochi, which is a great novel, um, uh, and 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 then uh, 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 this French lesbian Malejuris next year, um, The Illusionist, which is a great lesbian novel as well. Um, those books were um, were translated, but hardly sold any copies uh, when. Uh, I think The Illusionist was published by FSJ. I think it sold like 15 or 2,000 copies, which is really pathetic. Um, and and we sold, I think, like you know, 700 copies of Another Love. And those are great, great books. So I would encourage you all to uh, to look for those those books as well, because when you read, first of all, I can guarantee that you will like it. Um, um, but when you buy one of, those, one of these books, you, you encourage us to publish those books and you make it possible for, for, for presses to actually take the risk of translating the books and, and publishing it. Um, so, you know, just think about it. So now I think to open up to the comments, the suggestions, the questions of the tremendous uh, instance. Tremendous collection of people we have gathered here in this room. Yeah. <laughs> um, I moved from book selling to libraries in the early 80s and then had a bookstore for a short time in the late 80s, early 90s. But one of the things I noticed when I got into libraries after having kind of volunteered at a woman's place here was that there are all these dyke librarians hiding out at least. <laughs> 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 if you have a sense of what the Dyke librarians basically what effect those have had on lesbian pu publishing if, if you've been able to feel that effect or is it inconsequential compared to like bookstores John? Well, well I can speak to that the, uh, I'm going to do a little question repeating just okay. you want to do for that the sake of the video yeah. the question a short form was what impact have all the lesbians out there in library land had on publishing? Yeah. And supporting the publishing. And supporting the publishing. Um, when, when, we di when we did uh, Gloria and Sardua's Borderlands La Frontera in uh, 1987, and um, I went to the library journal, I actually, when we were there for the American Booksellers Association, I actually make an appointment with this woman at the library journal who really acted like she was not having any of this, and she, maybe she had three minutes for me, and da-da-da. So I walked in, and she was a dyke. You know, she was sitting there clearly and uh, receptive to the fact that I, that I was there. She just happened to have the New York spirit about, <laughs> no, 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 stay away from me. But, but once there, she was abs absolutely wonderful about taking a look at that book, which was very edgy at the time. I mean, uh, nobody even understood what it was for so long, except this woman did. And, she, and not only did they review it, but thanks to her, they selected it as one of their most important books in uh, 50 books of that year. And I'm convinced, uh, and of course because it had so much lesbian content, I'm convinced if she herself had not been a lesbian that that probably would not have happened. And um, uh, that she saw the scope of that book, of a, of a, a lesbian uh, growing up on the borderlands, and um, 
I think it helped make that book what it what it is today. So so that's just a a sort mm -hmm. of narrative that that's very specific. But I think those women are everywhere, and they're constantly helping all of us, and they're certainly helping the readers find the books, which is really what's important to us. And um, you know, we've always tried to work very closely with them in our distribution networks to try and get the books to libraries because we know that's where we want them, and that's where the young people find them. So. I have one more thing to add. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I always have one more thing to add. It's, uh, <laughs> is, is not only, I think, um, uh, Guinness has been librarians have supported our books, but, but in the case of Clear's Press, uh, uh, Jim Van Buskirk, who is um, a great lesbian, uh, <laughs> <laughs> has been instrumental in our publishing schedule because you know there are many books that we would have never published without Jim's help finding the books, uh, the lesbian pop um, books in, in, in particular. And, you know, and that's, um, that's, that's a tremendous uh, function um, of librarians that not all librarians really take to heart, I think. But you know, we're really lucky to have, um, to yeah. have the James Hormos um, uh, collection in, in San Francisco and Karen's work and so forth. Um, because, because it's just incredible. The, the power that, that librarians could have on, on, um, on the developing the, the list of, of the publishers who are willing to listen to them. They're an incredible resource for us. And I would also add the incredible advocacy that librarians have done about refusing to allow books to be censored yes. in schools and libraries and keeping the books out there come hell or high water and sometimes careers. I want to add something to that too. <laughs> um, our plan with Edgework Books is to donate all the leftover copies uh, that we have from Edgework to um, libraries so that um, they have an existence beyond uh, being stored somewhere and uh, trickle selling. I mean, they still do, but so little that we felt it would be really the right action to get them out to the libraries. Oh, how do you do that? Uh, well, I don't know. I'm a librarian, so that's why I answer. We don't throw books at my university, but the public libraries don't throw books, but they read books that are not very popular, so make sure that your books are properly cataloged and not end up at the community fridge for 50 cents. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alan? Yeah, um, two things. One about the library question, I know. Uh, I used to have it's Mr. Wisdom and uh, uh, library subscriptions kept it, and I'm sure many other small mm -hmm. feminist journals afloat during mm -hmm. uh, the, the libraries uh, just renewed them automatically year after year, <laughs> even in the years when there was only one issue or two years without an issue. They kept renewing them, <laughs> and those journals, many of them wouldn't uh, wouldn't still exist. And it's Mr. Wisdom made a comeback this year with its new editor. So, oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just the public. Information is doing very well. It has a new issue on activism. Any of you activists want to submit things? The deadline's next week. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be very active. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. <laughs> and the other thing is about um, international publishing. Interestingly, my biggest support has been from international publishers in England. Only woman in Germany, Kugin Schattenberger, and in, uh, and in Canada, Canada. Uh, yeah. Press Gang, and then uh, Raincoast. And, mm -hmm. and uh, my experience is those uh, presses in other countries are much have been much more willing to take a risk anyway mm. than me. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, also that audiences in other countries besides this one uh, come out. You know, in Canada, it wasn't unusual for the small presses uh, for for uh, press gang when it was before it was driven into bankruptcy by unfortunate circumstances, but, but they had a following, and 300 people would come out in Vancouver and Toronto to their readings of new authors that people didn't really know about um, regularly, mm -hmm. and they'd come any time Presque put on a reading. This isn't true in the States. Uh, Well-known writers, except if you're at the level of Louise Erdrich, um, you do a reading in a city, you're lucky if 20 people. In San Francisco, mm -hmm. in, in Chicago, you go to these cities, 20 people come out, Somebody does a lot of free publicity at the university sponsors it, maybe 50. So I think one of the things that 
is important for lesbian publishing is to really work with local audiences to get the, the writer audience interface going in a stronger way. And it's also, of course, that the, the small presses are supported in a way, both culturally and, and by the government in those countries that they weren't here. Yeah. But still one of the really important things for, for small publishers to, to work on. Yep. More comments? Brett? Um, I was waiting for some in off Boston, so I will. Um, I mean, it published in Boston every 20,000 articles. So do you, but how do you advise, what do you advise people who have maybe a book proposal? <laughs> how do they go about it? Do you get an agent so they can say words like a press or do they get a big submission? Sorry, it's a craft, but I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for us, you can go on our website, uh, www.antloot.com, pretty simple, and, uh, and see what the guidelines are. And that, that's, but but um, we always advise people with manuscripts to really do their re homework and research about the presses that you're, that you're submitting to, to see what works they produce. Because if they're not producing... If they don't have an audience for the book you're doing, they're, not, they're probably not going to build one. So, so you want to get with a press that would have an audience for your book, unless they're Cleus, yes, <laughs> who builds it. And, and and in fact, we too build an audience almost every time we do a book. But that's more about you know getting into community centers and so forth, which is which is a lesson that we did have to learn and um, how to when you when you have grassroots roots work, you have to go into grassroots to find the audience. But Anyway, yes, unless you're Cleus. But anyway, that's number one. Do your research so that when you write your letter, your letter is directed towards that publisher about why your work uh, would be good for them and uh, why, why you feel there would be an audience for you there. Because then it makes the publisher think, okay, well, we, we're starting with number one. She understands audience and she understands that there might be a match. So that, I would, that's what I would advise is do some research. I mean, Did you, did you want me to? Um, first of all, don't feel cross. It's, you know, we wouldn't be publishing if you were not asking that kind of questions. It's so it's sort of important. Um, you can send us a, a, a um, book proposal, uh, depending on what you're writing, or um, a, a sample, or you can send it to us on email, on the attachment, so you can send it to us in the mail. Um, and um, if we fall in love with it, then we'll publish it. <laughs> um, way in the back. Just, I just have a little uh, history sort of point of reference that was Could you maybe that stand? We discussed earlier. Uh, how, how did uh, Naya Press get involved with, with Christine Jorgensen uh, and the story about the will and finding the will? How Clears. The story behind Christine Jorgensen. Um, the book had been published in, I think, 1967. I'm not sure about my dates. I'm not good at dates, okay? <laughs> um, and, but she's uh, good at publishing it. What do you want, anyway? <laughs> uh, it had been published in hardcover by a small publisher in... Uh, New York in hardcover, and then it had been published, I think, by Putnam in uh, softcover. The rights reverted, apparently, to uh, the large publisher. And then um, it's very complicated. I don't know exactly. Uh, I think it was Erickson's books, something like that. Um, uh, Christine uh, then uh, died, and uh, there was apparently, um, there was no will. Uh, so um, I did a lot of research and, uh, and just couldn't find any clue as to uh, um, where to find the will or anything. And then suddenly, I think two years after I started doing the research, I thought, the and I called Susan Stryker. And Susan Stryker said, oh, yeah. And write all the names of the nieces and nephews of Christine Jorgensen and told me that Christine Jorgensen, at the end of her life, 
had been living in, uh, in a house in Southern California and that she had a roommate who uh, also had gone through uh, um, an operation and was living with her when this was happening and so forth, and they were uh, quite good friends, gave me the name of, uh, of um, that woman who completely escapes me right now, and the name of a, a transsexual activist in England who um, might know of her. So I got in touch with a guy in England who told me, yeah, she lives in Brenda. Brenda, her name is Brenda Lana Smith, uh, lives in Bodmin. <laughs> uh, and I have to say, I have to pre preface that but the, uh, with the fact that the book um, was, uh, the reason why we were interested in the book to start with because was because Don Weiser was an editor at Cleus. Uh, I think I'd found a copy here. So, you know, and I'd read it and came back to the press and said, this is really interesting. So anyway, we uh, go back to Bodmin there. Uh, uh, we, uh, both Don and I traveled to Bodmin. Um, one morning arrived there and this woman who, uh, this large woman uh, was waiting for us at the station and we got in the car and um, Don had just arrived uh, from the States and he was really jet lagged and I was, had been in London for a few days and he, we had like, had no breakfast or had like, you know, coffee at the station. And we got into the car and Brenda told us, okay, well, I've got everything ready. Um, I've got whiskey, vodka, gin. <laughs> and we were like, she was rattling the names of all this alcohol and we were getting really sort of queasy. Um, <laughs> And, and then we arrived in this extraordinary little apartment. Bodmin is a very small town. Uh, uh, and she was living in this tiny apartment. And we arrived there, and there were pictures of Christine Jorgensen everywhere and Jane Russell. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bizarre. It was really bizarre. And, um, and she told us that, well, um, I think, and then pictures of the house where she was raised. And then as she was talking about her life and she had been, uh, um, and her life as a man, she had been a, a general counsel of Denmark in Bermudas, but she was English, it was weird. Um, and um, really lovely conversation. And so we started talking and, and it turns out that her father um, divorced her mother and then got married to Jane Russell. So oh that's how the Jane God. Russell thing. So we were sort of like, this is really hot. Here we are in Bodmin, and you know, there's like all these pictures of things. It's just like, and um, and then she talked to us about Christine Jorgensen and how she'd lived with Christine and how they um, they used to party a lot together. And and she would, for instance, like take Christine to chemotherapy. Christine had cancer. Uh, and then they would stop at hotels and have like this huge gin and tonics after chemotherapy. <laughs> and um, in the meantime, she's telling us all the stories and we still haven't eaten. And it's like six o'clock at night and Dawn is like about to pass out. In fact, I think he sort of passed out or threw up or something. It was just really a bad, bad scene there. Um, and, um, and then she came out with copies um, of the will and nobody knew where the will was. Uh, and gave us copies of the wills and photographs. We went through albums and mm -hmm. so forth, uh, photographs. And then, so we had everything. Uh, then we came back to the States and I found out that the, uh, the lawyer, no, I f just forgot his name. Donald yeah, the, the lawyer who was uh, about to, uh, who, who was the executor of the will, the lawyer was Donald Segretti. Do you remember who Donald Segretti is? Mm -mm. Yeah. Donald Segretti was uh, was uh, hired by the uh, the uh, the committee the committee to reelect the president <laughs> Nixon to disrupt democratic events before Watergate. Oh my God! And was uh, arraigned during Watergate and so forth, and did some time in jail, I believe, and so forth. So we then had to find Donald Segretti. Well, where's <laughs> Donald Segretti? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and we finally found Donald Segretti, mm -hmm. called Donald Segretti, sent letters to Donald Segretti, knew where he was, talked to his secretary, but he apparently was working like, you know, 
30 minutes a week and was never answering phone calls. So finally, we got a lawyer to write to Donald Segretti because we thought he's going to answer a lawyer saying, you were supposed to settle this will or whatever it is, probate this will, and you never did it. So, you know, get on it. So that's how we got the will probated. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and as it turns out, she had left uh, her um, estate or her um, writing to the motion picture and television fund, uh, Home for the Aged. And so we had to transfer the rights to them. And then they granted us the rights to publish the book. That's how it happened. <laughs> and it sold like 1,500 copies. <laughs> so far. still selling great. But you can make no. a movie out of your experience. But it was, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it really was an adventure. Yeah. women's bookstore movements and such, and having to distribute within the larger corporations out there, how do you see that affecting the, the lesbian erotica specifically? Do you feel that there'll be a censorship or a reduction in your production of, of choosing those types of books in the future? I, I would like Felice to answer that question, actually. <laughs> would you mind? Okay. Yeah, you can come sure. over here. Uh, we haven't had any censorship problems with any book that's primarily text. We've had censorship problems getting books printed that are graphic, like Annie Sprinkle and books like that have been, we've had to go out of the U.S. We actually had to print that book in Canada, which is very ironic. What year? What year? Annie Sprinkle? Yeah. I don't know. I really have to think about it. <laughs> Somewhere in the 90s. Yeah, good. That's Somewhere good. in the 90s. Okay. Um, no, uh, you know, we publish a lot of erotica anthologies. They sell really well. They're really popular and they're really fun to publish. And um, the, there are certain limitations on the covers that come out of the chains. And it's not like an edict. It's more like we show the covers to our distributors and the buyer for Barnes and Noble and the buyer for Borders and the buyer for, buyer for this or that is sitting there saying, you know, I this isn't, this isn't going to go over. Um, but we keep we push it. So um, Frederic actually has a lot to do with this, but uh, Frederic is the art director. But we really push it. Like Cleus, you know, broke the nipple barrier, and you know, we were the first ones to have women's nipples on the cover of a erotica book and I didn't even know we were doing it until after it had been done it's like oh yeah there's nipples on that book and no one said anything you know the um uh we got in trouble with a book recently uh the cover is a photograph that's like a vintage erotica it's the book wicked it's um oh, yeah. erotic fantasy stories of famous people so there's you know made up erotic stories about mm -hmm. historical mm -hmm. figures. And there's this, you know, sexy, vintage, sepia-like image. And uh, there's a shadow where her thighs meet. And oh my god, if you took a magnifying glass, you would see pubic hair. And this is this vintage art iconic thing. And we had to, uh, what did we have to do? Amazon wouldn't. Depilate her. We had to depilate her. We <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Amazon. So kinky. Amazon <laughs> wouldn't. <laughs> on Amazon, it was like a blank. <laughs> and for Amazon to show the picture, we had to like get rid of the pubic hair. And <laughs> we had to Photoshop it. You know, but it's, but it's at Barnes & Noble, you know. So, I the mean, it's. Hair is it's, yeah. Yes, the pubic hair. We nailed it. So um, it's <laughs> totally inconsistent. But we're not. We're not having. You know, they don't really care. They're in it for the buck. They really don't care. And basically, the more visible we are, the more we're imitated by the New York publishers. So now there's this huge amount of competition because everybody imitates what we do, which is not necessarily a terrible thing. It means there's more books for you to choose from, and we think quality always wins out. And so we're not too worried about it. And 
Um, so there's more of a large section of lesbian and gay and queer erotica, which is okay. We try to be positive about it. So now we think that Amazon is really to shave pussies. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be our next anthology. <laughs> and you were here for it. You don't want to be the editor? <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. It's it's an actual um, yeah it is yeah she she has tremendous press doesn't she <laughs> <laughs> and she's proud of it okay last question I have an anecdote from um, oh. the early I guess mid seventies I had this little feminist bookstore in. And friends of mine kept saying, you got to carry this newspaper from Denver. you got to carry Big Mama Rag. So I sent him a postcard. Tell me your bulk discount rates. No answer. So I sent him a letter. No answer. So I sent him a huge piece of tissue paper, and I wrote on it, send me 10 copies. I'll send you some money. <laughs> and I folded it all up and put it in a regular little tiny envelope, you know. And uh, when I finally met up with the women who published Big Mama Rag at a um, women of print conference, they said, well, you know, we got your postcard and we got your letter and we all sat around the table trying to figure out what the bulk discount meant. <laughs> <laughs> and we were so happy when we got your tissue paper. We just sent you 20 copies. <laughs> So that was the world as we invented it. So maybe on that note, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to the library for having us yes. and to all of the, the fine panelists present in absentia and in imitation.